Father God, thank you for the season of Advent, the season of waiting, waiting for the most precious gift. Help us to make the season one where we spend time with you, when we become quiet, when we read our scriptures, and we understand and le learn and understand more and more of what it is that you've done for us. Thank you, Father God. Thank you for your love, your care, your grace, and your mercy. Pray that you would use this time to your honor and glory. For Jesus Christ's sake. Amen. Good morning everyone and welcome. I greet you all in the precious name of Jesus Christ our Lord and our Saviour. This morning is the first Sunday in Advent, so we gather to worship. Lord God of hosts, enthroned upon the cherubim, give ear to us, restore us and save us. Lord God of hosts, shepherd of Israel, give ear to us, restore us and save us. Lord God of hosts, let your face shine. Give ear to us, restore us, and save us. The lessons that are set for today are in the book of Isaiah, chapter 64, verses 1 to 9, Psalm 80, verses 1 to 7, and 17 to 19, 1 Corinthians, chapter 1, verses 3 to 9, and the Gospel is from St. Mark, Chapter 13, verses 24 to 37. Listen to the good news proclaimed in the Gospel according to Mark, chapter 13, verses 24 to 37. But in those days, following that distress, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky, and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time, men will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory, and he will send his angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of the heavens. Now learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Even so, when you see these things happening, you know that it is near, right at the door. I tell you the truth, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. No one knows about that day or hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard. Be alert. You do not know when that time will come. It's like a man going away. He leaves his house and puts his servants in charge, each with his assigned task, and tells the one at the door to keep watch. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know when the owner of the house will come back, whether in the evening, or at midnight, or when the cock crows. Or at dawn. If he comes suddenly, do not let him find you sleeping. What I say to you, I say to everyone, watch. This is the Gospel of Christ. Praise to Christ our Lord. together. 
Almighty Father, your Son came to us in humility as our Saviour, and at the last day he will come again in glory as our Judge. Give us grace to turn away from darkness to the light of Christ, that we will be ready to welcome him who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Holy Spirit of God, would you brood over me? Would the words I speak be the words that you long for us to hear this morning? Come, Holy Spirit of God. Come, Holy Spirit. Have you also been inundated with WhatsApp messages and videos about COVID-19 second wave. Her hospitals are not coping, people are dying in passages, uh, not enough PPEs available, medical staff are getting sick, wards are full, the numbers are rising, and so are the deaths. The situation is very, very bad, and that's all true. But in the midst of all these, I have not had one person contact me to say, can we arrange a prayer meeting, please? Can we please pass on these prayers, which are so encouraging? Can we please offer each other hope? I think Robin said it last week when he reminded us that 2020 is not the year of COVID. It is the year of our God's reign. He is and remains in control. I found this poem from Pastor J. Todd Jenkins based on the poem, it was the night before Christmas. It was the beginning of Advent and all through the church, our hope was all dying. We'd given up on the search. It wasn't so much that Christ wasn't invited, but after 2000 plus years, we were no longer excited. Oh, we knew it was coming, no doubt about that. And that was the trouble. It was all old hat. November brought the first of an unending series of pains with carefully orchestrated advertising campaigns. There were gadgets and dolls and all sorts of toys, enough to seduce even the most devout girls and boys. Unfortunately, it seemed, no one was completely exempt from the seasonal virus that did all of us tempt. The priests and the prophets and certainly the kings were all so consumed with their desire for things. It was rare, if at all, that you'd hear of the reason for the origin of this whole holy day season. A baby, it seems, once had been born in the Mideast somewhere on that first holy day morn. But what does that mean for folks like us who've lost ourselves in the hoopla and fuss? Can we relearn the art of wandering and waiting, of hoping and praying and anticipating? Can we let go of all the things and the stuff? Can we open our hands and our hearts long enough? Can we open our eyes and open our ears? Can we find him again after all these years? Will this year be different from all the rest? Will we be able to offer him all of our best? So many questions unanswered thus far as wise men seeking the home of the star. Where do we begin? Where do we start to make for this child a place in our heart. Perhaps we could begin by letting go of our limit on hope and of the stuff that we know. Let go of the shopping and of the chaos and fuss. Let go of the searching. Let Christmas find us. We open our hearts, our hands and our eyes to see the King coming in our neighbor's cries we look without seeking what we think we've earned, but rather we're looking for relationships burned. With him, he brings wholeness and newness of life for brother and sister, for husband and wife, 
that Christ child comes not by our skill, but rather he comes by his own Father's will. We can't make him come with parties and bright trees, but only by getting down on our knees. He'll come if we wait amidst our affliction, coming in spite of, not by our restriction. His coming will happen. Of this, there's no doubt. The question is whether we'll be in or out. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Do you have the courage to peer through the lock? A basket on your porch, a child in your reach, a baby to love, to feed, and to teach. He'll grow in wisdom as God's only son. How far will we follow this radical one? He'll lead us to challenge the way that things are. He'll lead us to follow a single bright star that will come later if we're still around. The question for now, is the child to be found? Can we block out commercials, the hype and the malls? Can we find solitude in our holy halls? Can we keep alert, keep hope, stay awake? Can we receive this child for hours and God's sake? From on high with the caroling host as he sees us, he yearns to read on our lips the prayer, Come, Lord Jesus. As Advent begins, all these questions make plea. The only answer, we will see. We will see. Isaiah, the writer of the Old Testament passage, said for today, lived at a very difficult time. Many scholars believe that Isaiah was amongst the Jewish exiles had been taken to Babylon after the fall of Jerusalem in 586 BC. So he was a refugee living in a foreign land in a hostile country, 700 miles from his beloved homeland and from Solomon's temple in Jerusalem. He was forced to live away from his family, his friends, um, he, from hearing the Torah read in the temple, missing out on all the festivals, Babylon was a land that no Jew wanted to step in, much less live in. The land stood for all that was unholy, unclean, and ungodly. He could have given up hope. He could have decided to let go of his faith, to follow one of the many other gods that were around at that time. But in his heart, he knew that the Lord God Almighty existed. He knew that he cared for creation and that he watched over mankind. Isaiah knew it was because of their sin, this, his sin and Israel's sin, that they were in this position. And Isaiah pinned his hope on God. And this hope led him to do amazing things. The first one was he called out to God for divine in intervention. He said, we wish you would tear open heaven and come down so that the mountains would shake at your presence. He asked God to start a fire that would destroy all evil. He wanted, to God, he wanted God to shake up the surrounding nations. He wanted God to come down and put things right. He longed for God to reveal himself to the world as he had done so many times in the past so that they would acknowledge and worship the only true God of the universe. You now, Isaiah probably referred to fire because he remembered the burning bush and Moses, the pillar of fire that had accompanied the Israelites through the desert from Egypt. He would have remembered how the mountain was on fire when God gave the Ten Commandments to Moses and how the fire of God had come down on the tab tabernacle and the temple and that they had shone with Shekinah glory. He knew that their only hope was God, the God of Israel, the God of the covenant, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Without God, there was no hope for the future. It is that same God that we worship today, the great I Am, 
the great shepherd, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It is the same God who 5,000 to 6,000 years later would come down in the form of his son, Jesus Christ, to intervene in the world. It is the God who did come down in power and the presence of fire and the Holy Spirit who cleanses and purifies and transforms us into God's image. Secondly, Isaiah thought that because of the hope he had, he was able to offer a prayer of confession because he realized it was their sins which had separated them from God, which had angered God. He admitted that they had been unclean before the Lord in their prayer lives, in their discipleship lives, and in their stewardship lives. Israel had allowed her sins to pollute the beautiful garments of salvation that God had designed for them. They had allowed them to be turned into filthy rags. Isaiah said that no one was attempting to call on the name of the Lord. No one understood that God, that before God intervened, sin must be put aside and cast out of their lives and the nation's lives. Thirdly, Isaiah uses powerful images. He calls God Father, and he says he is the potter, and we are the clay. Though he was sitting in a foreign land, Isaiah asked God to shape his life and the lives of the people around him, to continue to mold them so that they could be a witness for him. We also seem to be in this foreign time do we call upon God to shape our lives? Clay reminds us how frail we are. Left to ourselves, we become hard and stubborn instead of being pliable in the hands of the potter. Isaiah was asking God to put his hands on them, moving them this way and that, pulling, pushing, shaping, breaking and rebuilding so that they could be vessels for God's honor and glory. You are the potter, and I am the clay. Break me and mold me. That is what I pray. Is this truly our prayer? Father, here I am. Clay in your hands. Clay that is pliable, moldable. Make me a vessel. Make me an offering. Make me whatever you want me to be. Paul had established the church at Corinth, and now he received reports about their moral laxity and how they were sinning. So he sent a letter to them. But notice how he begins the letter. He begins by giving thanks for the Corinthians. Paul's thanksgiving is also addressed to God. Thanksgiving for God's work and God's grace amongst them. Paul reminded them that whatever knowledge they had and whatever abilities they possessed had been given to them by God. God had given them spiritual gifts to use for the building up of God's church, a church that awaited God's revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul grounded his whole letter in the work of God amongst them and reminded them that God is faithful. God was the one who had called them into this fellowship. There would be no church without God and God would see them through. Whatever problems they were facing, the God who called them was powerful enough not only to help them, but them to help them to find a way forward, to strengthen them even as they waited for the revelation of Jesus. The same is true for us. It is God who calls us together in fellowship. It is God who gives us spiritual gifts to build up His church. It is God who will help us overcome our present trials and difficulties. It is God who will see us through COVID. God alone is the author and perfecter 
of our faith. Mark reminds his readers that Jesus Christ said there would be troubles, that nothing is permanent, not even heaven and earth. Mark's primary theological question makes a good Advent question. Where will we look for God this Advent season? Where you find God might depend on what you are looking for. Jesus warned his disciples to be watchful for those who look to false messiahs and false prophets. And our newspapers have been full of those lately. And that's often the problem. Things that are false, which are evil, which could lead us astray, can all too often have the appearance of what is good. We wouldn't sin if sin didn't look so good. You know, the disciples can't even imagine the destruction of the beautiful temple. But out of the turmoil and confusion surrounding the destruction of the temple would be a new presence of God. Out of the suffering and death of their Messiah would be new life. God's new way of being in the world would turn a cross into resurrection and a baby in the manger, salvation for the whole world. There's a word that Mark uses, schizo, S-C-H-I-Z-O, and it's used only in chapter 1, verse 10, to describe what happened as, uh, to the heavens at Jesus' baptism, and, at the, and it's again used in chapter 15, verse 38, describing the temple curtain being torn into two, Anything that can simply be open can simply be shut again. But God, but Mark's gospel tells us that they were ripped open. The heavens were opened. The temple was ripped apart. The temple curtain was ripped apart. Whatever separates us from God, either the heavens or the Holy of Holies, has been torn asunder and can never go back to the way it was before. There's no keeping God at a distance anymore. God is not and will not be where we expect to find God. No longer will God remain in the heavens or behind a curtain or high up on a hill. No longer will we need to plead, oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down. Emmanuel, God is with us. God is within us. He has come and he will come again. You know, many people live and even die with guilt, unreconciled with the past, grieving for what is lost, and they find it difficult to find to receive God's forgiveness and to apply it to their lives. But these two chap previous readings remind us that confession moves the heart of God to act with grace and forgiveness. When we become people who embrace confession, we become people of grace, people of forgiveness, and people of reconciliation. And how our world needs such people. This morning as we look at the first Advent candle, we are reminded that we are living in a time of great hope. Did you hear that? Hope, great hope. We are living in a time when we know that God intervenes in our world. We know that because we know the story of Jesus and we know the power and presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. God's Holy Spirit guides us, leads us, fills us with power to reflect God's glory and honor. We live in hope because we know we can bring all our fears our mistakes, our brokenness, and all our sin to God. We can bring all the burdens that weigh us down. We can bring all our doubts that make us less than we are meant to be. We can bring everything to God because He knows us and He loves us. He forgives us. He cleanses us. He restores us. He renews us. He makes us whole again. Restore us, O oh God of hosts. Let your face shine that we may be saved. We live in hope because we are clay in the hands of the master potter who is molding us and making us. 
But you know what? He's not finished with us yet. And so we pray, Maranatha, come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. Come. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God, who did awesome deeds from ages past, grant you the blessing of grace and peace in Jesus Christ, so that you will thank him always. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God, and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be with you and those whom you love and pray for this day and forevermore.